Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The Mauryas were responsible for patronizing Jainism as under Chandragupta Maurya and also Buddhism as under the emperor Ashoka. They patronized architecture in the form of big cave complexes. Monastic orders stayed in these cave complexes through the rainy season. They also sponsored the construction of stupas all across the country, also extending to Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia and into Afghanistan where the Mauryas had many kinds of contacts. But after the Mauryas, in the 2nd, 1st century BCE, there arose a whole set of new kingdoms, including that of the Satvahanas or the Shalivahanas who were based in the Deccan, the western satraps who were based in western India and the Kushans who appeared late on scene in the 1st century CE who are a tribe from Central Asia with their headquarters somewhere around the Fergana Valley in Afghanistan who then become an expansive empire covering a lot of the Gangetic Plain. There are four major dynasties which arise in the wake of the Mauryas. These four dynasties were the Shungas who were mostly in northern India in the eastern Gangetic Plain, the Satvahanas who were in the Deccan, the Kushans who were in the north e or the northwest and the western satraps who were in western India in present day Rajasthan, Gujarat and northern Maharashtra. All these dynasties patronized Buddhism at some point and also helped in the construction of large Buddhist architectural monuments. It is in this period that you start having huge renovations of stupas at places like Sanchi and Bharhut and also Amravati from where you find large scale reliefs that show the architecture of the period. This architecture is largely composed of or constructed in wood. But over here in these reliefs it is replicated in stone and what we shall see with the cave sites of uh, the Buddhist period is that these cave sites will mimic wooden architecture and construct in stone what was constructed as freestanding buildings in wood. And here you have an example of reliefs from Sanchi in which you see a number of huts with these dormer windows with wooden rafters sticking out and all these huts symbolize places where a holy man would have stayed most likely in this case the Buddha. Now this is the great and iconic period in Buddhism. Both Buddha and Mahavira are not depicted in any kind of anthropomorphic or human form till sometime around the 1st century BC, 1st century AD. And there is a wonderful essay on the early forms of Buddhist sculpture by the famous art historian Anand Kumar Swami. In any case, till these representations of the Buddha and of Mahavira become popular, the only way in which the Buddha is depicted is by using symbols of his life, notably an architectural symbol, that of a hut which will house a holy man. And therefore you see here people worshipping what would be the Buddha except you don't see the presence of the Buddha, it's felt through these huts in which he would have stayed. You also find in this period on the great toranas or the gateways of these stupas, entire scenes that depict the cityscape of this period. This shows you that though we don't have the material evidence for architecture of this scale anywhere extant, we know that cities are being built on a large scale in wood and sometimes in brick and this is most likely what they look like. And it is these top wooden parts of cities that you see constructed in wood, represented in stone, that will form the basis of architectural expression in stone-cut architecture, most notably the cave complexes 
uh, the most famous ones of which are at places like Ajanta. The Buddha is represented through a variety of means, sometimes only through a throne, which signifies his royal birth, sometimes the footstool, which is under the throne, and sometimes the tree, which is supposed to be the tree under which he received enlightenment. And therefore, very often, to indicate worship of the Buddha, you will find reliefs at all these sites of nothing more than a tree on a platform and the tree is being worshipped, the tree standing in for the presence of the Buddha and his enlightenment. Note in this relief the railings on top and bottom which are used to divide the frieze into multiple registers. These railings would have originally been wooden railings but by the time we get to the second, first, second century CE, these railings are being constructed in stone, trying to mimic this wood. These are the toranas outside the Sanchi stupa on which these reliefs of cityscapes can be seen. These doorways are rich in representation of life in this period, but what you do not have at all is any kind of form of the Buddha himself. What you do start finding early on in the 2nd century BC are representations of these stupas. A stupa is nothing but a funerary mound in which sometimes you have a reliquary, a small container in which relics of the Buddha, which might be body parts of the Buddha, would have been kept. Here you see in the forest elephants worshipping a stupa Straight on axis on the same torana, on top, you see buffaloes worshipping a tree on a platform. This is a close-up of exactly the same relief. And here you can clearly see the stupa, which is one of the first extant freestanding architectural remains we have from this period. We have seen a number of cave sites that try to mimic wooden architecture on the inside of the cave. But it is from the second century BCE to the 1st century CE that we find remnants of the earliest stupas which are freestanding structures and by this time the stupa has become completely articulated in terms of the elements that make it up and so the big rounded mound is called an under. The whole railing around it is well defined with a number of freeze bands you have staircases that run up, staircases called Sopana and right on top you have an altar-like set of umbrellas called the Hermica. You also have a tree set on a platform which is being worshipped by a number of wild animals here and this is indicative of the presence of the Buddha again. The tree remains an important icon of the Buddha for a long time to come. Here again you see one of the most famous reliefs from Sanchi in which you have a cityscape on your left from where a procession goes out with the Buddha and the Buddha is not shown figuratively but only signified through an umbrella that you see at various points including a horse on which there is an umbrella and right at the end as the horse drops off the Buddha and turns around and goes back, you have a pair of footprints which show that the Buddha is now in the forest. Notice that the Mauryan pillars with their capitals that we've seen earlier are being represented on these small vertical mountains of the Torna. So right in the middle, you have a lion capital with a Dharma Chakra on top, flanking which instead of columns you have trees with a set of umbrellas not unlike those that you would see on a stupa. You start having a more refined elaboration on the same theme where a number of these capital uh, bearing columns become part of an architectural ensemble. You start having a series of these columns supporting what looks like a palace structure and it is exactly this architecture that you'll see repeated 
in the Buddhist caves of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century CE. Again, there is a conflation of all these motifs that stand for various things. So here you have at the bottom a platform on which is a crown, which is then covered by a hut through which, through the center of which grows a tree and on top of this tree is an umbrella. All these elements, the platform, the, the throne, uh, I mean sorry, the crown, the railing, the hut, the tree and the umbrella are all symbols that represent the Buddha who is being worshipped by worshippers on either side in the Anjali Mudra. And yet, while this relief that we saw, which you see on your left hand side, uh, is an important way of depicting the Buddha, what you see on the right hand side is a holy man sitting inside a hut and also a hut covering what seems to be a pre-Buddhist Naga deity. So the idea that some kind of architectural hut shelters, covers, encloses and represents a holy presence is a pre-Buddhist idea that's taken up with great vigor by the early Buddhists. Again, what you see as a tree on top is represented through a set of huts at the bottom. The stupa is an architectural expression that will become ever more important as the imagery of the tree slowly disappears. But the hut, which so far had been a simple hut, starts transforming into a mansion, into a palace. Because here you have a very important holy personage for whom a mere hut is not enough, particularly if you have imperial patronage for this cult of the Buddha, the buildings that represent the presence of the Buddha have to go beyond a simple hut. They have to be palatial now. And so you see a slow transformation of a simple hut into a multi-storied mansion and eventually into a large palace. But here you can still see the platform and the tree being enclosed by this kind of building. There are a number of carved examples of all these hybrids where all these symbols are brought together in a way that has multiple valencies. And so every time you see any of these elements, you know exactly which holy man is being represented. When you see a cluster of them together on a vertical axis, right from a mansion, a hut, a platform, a tree, an umbrella, you know what is being represented and who is being worshipped. But perhaps the most uh, telling monuments of this age are the freestanding stupas which we've seen represented in relief sculpture but of which a number survive, particularly the ones at Sanchi and in part at Bharhut, at Amravati which is largely dismantled and a newly discovered stupa at a place called Kanganhalli close to Sanati in North Karnataka. This last stupa was discovered only in the past two decades and is still being explored and excavated by the Archaeological Survey of India. What you see here, however, is the stupa at Sanchi, very clearly articulated as a big mound, domical in form, surrounded by a railing, which is a stone railing made to look like a wooden railing, with four entrances at the four cardinal directions, beyond which would be these toranas or gateways. Worshippers would go around, circumambulate this stupa, and inside it would have been a small chamber which housed a reliquary, a small chamber or a box that would have contained relics of the Buddha. The Kushanas, who are contemporary with and will follow the Satvahanas, though they have their roots in Central Asia, were a dynasty pragmatic enough to patronize almost every religion and every cult that was in the lands and domains that they controlled. And therefore, when the Kushans come to northern India, they worship 
a number of, or at least uh, have anthropomorphic representations of a number of deities that one might consider proto-Hindu, but also Buddhist. They will issue coins with Buddha, with Vasudeva, with early forms of Shiva, such as Oisho. The Kushanas, we know, are actually a group from Central Asia called the Yuichi. And we know of their Central Asian origins also from statues of the great Kushan king Kanishka, who is always depicted with this long tunic and big boots, dress that is very typical of a non-Indic origin. The Kushans move in and while they establish themselves in Gandhara, in the northwest frontier of the Indian subcontinent, they slowly spread along the Gangetic Basin all the way into Mathura. And you have two very important schools of sculpture and also schools of architecture at both these places patronized by the same dynasty. The Satvahanas in the meantime have defeated to a large degree, the Western Kshatrapas who were in Maharashtra and Gujarat and they have been cornered into the Western part of the country where they will eventually disappear. The Kushanas have a number of freestanding stupas, but they also do leave behind large numbers of reliefs in which these stupas are represented and also the modes of worship in which the stupas are used are represented. And here you have a representation of a Kushan stupa in which you have a raised platform approached by a staircase on which you have a stupa, a very prominent set of umbrellas on top and in the four corners of this platform you have these four magnificent columns on top of which are animal capitals not unlike those you see in the Mauryan period. If you look at the dress of the worshippers, the Kushans have taken over Bactrian lands and the Greek influences in the clothing and the drapery are really quite noticeable. The Kushanas will also patronize two very important schools of sculpture. One is the Gandharan school, which has a number of innovations apart from using Hellenistic forms. And here you have more of the Kushan school of sculpture in Gandhara. But they also patronize another school called the Mathura school, which as opposed to the Gandharan school, which uses schist for its sculpture, this will use red mottled sandstone. And this school of sculpture that you see in the eastern part of the Kushan domains, this, these sculptures will be the early sculptures of Jainism, Buddhism and Hinduism with significant overlaps between the three. In fact, a number of forms such as the phallic linga that we see associated exclusively with Hinduism later on, one will also find associated with Buddhism and Jainism. Similarly, these toranas, these stupas and these railings are also associated with all three Indic faiths in this period. This is a period in which the Puranas are being composed and the mythological richness of Jainism, Buddhism and Hinduism is coming into being at the same time. They share a large mythological canvas. Many of the characters are the same. Indra will feature, for example, as the god of heavens in all three mythologies and will be depicted in similar ways in all three. And the Kushan period is really a most formative period for the representation of these shared deities in shared mythologies across Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism. It is also in this period that you have iconic representations of the Buddha and of Mahavira and of a number of Hindu cult deities for the first time. In fact, Buddhism, Jainism and Hinduism will start picking up attributes of the early Yaksha and Naga worship in Eastern India. So for example, Yakshas, Yakshis and Nagas are common to representations of Buddhist, Jain and Hindu deities, just as these railings and lingas and toranas are. 
After all, it is a shared mythological canvas with shared deities and with shared visual representations of worlds other than the ones that we inhabit. The Kushans leave behind a number of real stupas that don't survive in quite the good shape that you see in this relief. But a number of these stupas have been excavated and they have the same characteristics as the one you see in this relief. A high platform on the four corners of which you have columns with capitals on top and a big stupa in the middle. Unfortunately, the umbrellas on top do not survive. But it is these umbrellas, these stupas with the umbrellas that as they travel through in the first millennium CE, as they travel through Central Asia and into China, will become the grand pagodas that you find in China and Japan later on. Here are examples of the excavated ruins of Kushan stupas that you have across North India and Pakistan. In many ways, these stupas also share a number of features with early temples in these regions. The Kushans eventually will be followed by the Guptas and a number of dynasties in the Deccan such as the Vakatakas who will follow the Satvahanas. And what you see here are the caves at Ajanta built under the patronage of the Vakatakas who then become feudatories or equals or marital allies of the Guptas and we shall take a, a close look at the caves at Ajanta as this represents a very different high point of Buddhism in the Deccan. Probably one of the most important and formative periods of architecture in India is the reign of the Guptas, an imperial dynasty that ruled for over two centuries, mostly across northern India, but it was under their reign that you had a number of stable dynasties in South India and the Deccan, most notably the Vakatakas, who were related to the Guptas by marriage and who are known for having excavated the magnificent caves of Ajanta. The Guptas are important not just in the formation of architecture, but also for sculpture and also for giving a boost to classical Sanskrit. Poets like Kalidasa are from the period of the Guptas. You have enormous strides in the sciences and in mathematics and in a number of realms of learning. The Guptas promote all religions including Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism. But it is under them that we see a further efflorescence of what was started as the Mathura school under the Kushans. And here you have in Sarnath, in Varanasi, in Mathura, in eastern India, in the present day state of Uttar Pradesh, a number of magnificent examples of sculpture, most notably those of the Buddha. The Guptas have set up a number of important cities, including the complex of Vidisha, Sanchi and Udaigiri. What you see on this map is, at the bottom left, the site of Sanchi. The big urban cluster you see on the right hand side is the modern city of Vidisha. And up towards the north where you see two differently colored patches is the site of Udaigiri. All three sites were almost continuously inhabited uh, geographically under the Guptas and there, there are architectural and archaeological mounds that connect all three of them. All three sites are important for a variety of reasons and we shall quickly look at a couple of them, uh, Sanchi and Udaigiri. The site of Sanchi is possibly best known for the grand stupa that survives there, a stupa that was originally built uh, in the 2nd century BC but which was heavily repaired in the 1st century AD. The site contains a lot more than just that stupa. It contains a number of platforms, a number of freestanding buildings and a number of what might be the earliest temples and temple halls that survive in India. 
A conjectural reconstruction of what the site might have looked like in its heyday is given here, where you see buildings that look like timber architecture built in stone, such as the longitudinal hut you see on the right hand side of the stupa. The site now is in ruins and quite idyllic, but the custodian is the archaeological survey and archaeologically important things have been maintained there. Some part of the site has been reconstructed, but large parts exist as they were found. A number of the structures are given very unromantic names such as Temple 17 and Temple 40 which you see here. But these are very important buildings because they represent the first freestanding manifestations of timber buildings of this period. The railings of Sanchi Stupa mimic timber construction and right on the same site is a temple called Temple 17 which you see in front of the palm tree and it is this temple that is of great importance because this might be a Hindu temple and possibly the very first. It is a simple cubicle building with a porch in front and the porch is supported on four pillars. In plan, nothing complicated about it. In section, nothing complicated about it. If you look at the pillars in front, they are like the Ashokan pillars with these inverted lotus capitals and animals on top. If you look at the capitals in detail, you see lions. Temple 17 represents a, a, a Hindu temple in its most primordial form, much before the great temples that will evolve out of this over the next four, five, six hundred years. Similarly, at Udaigiri, close to Sanchi, is a set of caves built by the Guptas who also patronized Temple 17. And these caves are of extraordinary significance because you see for the first time certain kinds of Puranic deities being sculpted on the insides of these caves to be worshipped and to be ritually used. Remember this is also a period when texts like the Vishnu Dharmottara Purana have been composed and these are texts that talk of the duties of a king, of kingship, of the king being identified with deities like Vishnu and what you find at Udaigiri is an attempt to reconcile theories of kingship and the worship of Vishnu into one integrated site. The scholar Michael Willis has written a superb book about the site at Udaigiri called the Archaeology of Hindu Ritual. The site at Udaigiri consists of a number of groups of caves, some of which are simple and some of which are complex. Inside a number of these caves, you have iconic representations of deities of Hinduism and Puranic gods. Here you have a linga, which is slowly being manifest as a human face, that of Shiva. But possibly the most magnificent cave is what is called Cave 5, which shows the narrative of the Varaha avatar of Vishnu going down into the murky depths of the cosmic ocean and rescuing the earth who is hanging by his tusks as he stands triumphantly and in front of him are a number of worshippers on the ground and in the heavens are a number of heavenly beings who are also in awe of this magnificent feat. All these figures have been identified. Vishnu as Varaha, the earth goddess uh, hanging onto his snout, Brahma sitting on a lotus in front. But what is very important are the two life-size figures, number 14 and 13, 
who are in front, who actually are the Gupta king, Chandragupta II, and his minister, Virasena, identified by inscription. It is this interaction between the human world and the divine world that is made so explicit in this cave that this cave becomes a place of crossing over, a tirtha as it's called. And therefore, while strictly not a temple, it becomes a site in which to enact rituals and rites that connect you with a world beyond, much like a temple does. It is in the Gupta period that you have a small cubicle building like Temple 17, which probably houses a deity image on the inside. You have this valorization of Vishnu, identification of Vishnu with the ruler, and then also very early temples, such as what is called the Dashavatara temple at a place called Devgarh, also in present day Madhya Pradesh. The superstructure does not survive in very good shape, but the cubical sanctum, which is very important and in many ways a further evolution of Temple 17 survives. And what you have in this cubical sanctum is on the outside, on three sides, you would have had porches like the ones you have seen in Temple 17. The whole temple was set on a high platform, approachable by stairs, like we have seen with Kushan stupas. And on the three sides where you do not have a doorway are relief sculptures that show different manifestations, different avatars or different forms of the deities that is enshrined within. So the walls of the temple themselves become manifestations of the deity that is inside. The temple itself, while housing the deity, also is a manifestation of the deity. Another temple built around the same time is what is called the Parvati temple at a place called Nachna, again not too far away. The same kind of cubical sanctum set on a high platform, approachable by stairs. But in this case, the small wall that encloses the platform is built with rusticated masonry, which means if you look at it carefully, it resembles natural stones as one would find in mountains. And in many ways, it is meant to depict a small cubical sanctum on top of a mountain, just like a cave would have been. And therefore, a sanctum in the 5th, 6th centuries assumes all these meanings. A sanctum is like a cave, like a natural shelter, like an altar. A sanctum means all these things. It is also ultimately a house for a god. Eventually, these sancta will form into big mansions and palaces for the gods, not as simple shelters modeled along huts. If you look in South India around the same time, if you look at the early Chalukyas, they too are experimenting with various forms of temples. Famously, the erroneously named Lar Khan temple, which is completely built as though it were built in timber. It is a vernacular architectural form in wood, uh, but of course built in stone completely. And the sanctum is not where you would expect it right in the middle, it's right at the end. This is an early temple which is not quite resolved. One might have expected a central deity with ambulatory passages, but that is not the composition of this temple. Another temple that you see is the Durga temple at Aihole, not too far away, again built under the Chalukyas, where the apsidal form of the Chaityagrahas of the Buddhist stupa chambers is replicated to house a deity. Again, these are abortive attempts. These are architectural forms that do not really take off and lead anywhere. But what you see here is a superstructure that will be elaborated upon 
through time. Here again from our old friend Percy Brown are detailed drawings of these two temples built under the Chalukyas in the 6th century in Karnataka. Mm -hmm.